and introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, I am extremely happy that in a short notice, uh, Professor Luis Pesco from University of Maryland agreed to, you know, deliver this uh, virtual talk. Uh, and uh, briefly, uh, Luis actually, you know, uh, did his PhD in computational neuroscience from Boston University. And uh, subsequently, he uh, returned to Brazil, uh, I guess his home, where he completed a faculty position in computer science at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And then subsequently, he came back to US to, I think, start a very interesting career in National Institute of Mental Health in the Laboratory of Brain and Cognition under none other than Leslie Ungerleider. And then subsequently, he joined the Department of Psychology at Brain Sciences at Indiana University, Brown University first, and subsequently Indiana University, Bloomington. And then since 2010 onwards, I think he's in Department of Psychology, University of Maryland, in College Park, where he's a professor and also a director of the Maryland Neuroimaging Center. One of the interesting thing about Louis is that he is trying to understand basically the two dimensions of the brain, which usually is studied by people separately over a number of years. That is basically the affective dimension. And another one is basically the cognitive dimension. Okay. And these affective and cognitive dimensions are not separate the way Louis have actually thought about it and what about his findings that these two sufficiently interacts with each other. And uh, interestingly, I follow Louise's blog, which is actually highly recommended for some of you or all of you who may be interested because from that blog, which is called Cognition Emotion blog in WordPress, I got a lot of idea about how brain organization is what type of computation that goes on in the brain and etc cetera, etc cetera. so without any further ado i would welcome actually luis to deliver today's talk which is supposed to be a very interesting talk on cognition <laughs> emotion and their interaction with motivation okay luis uh, welcome to virtual meeting thank you very much for that kind introduction and for the the invitation here to talk and, and, and discuss with you. Um, I know that um, with the, um, the the connection might not allow, but if if a few people, I don't know if we should try this, but I know we prefer not to, but if a few people want to, to be on camera and so that at least I have some impression that I'm 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 in a in a in a presentation and, and, and not just talking to the void here in my room. In hearing my own echo, I think so that we can find a way, or maybe in the future we can find a way to have these meetings a little bit more feeling like a, a, an actual meeting, a more interactive meeting, which is so much more fun. But I think I think people are hearing you. Some of them has turned on their camera so that you get a feeling for a real, you know, talk. Okay. Um, so let me get started. I'm interested in, in the origins of the ideas that shape our field today. And, and you can hear me okay, right? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. So I'm, I'm very interested in the ideas that shape, that shape the way that we do research today. And I'm always very trying to read a lot to understand so how do we how do we currently think about how we should understand the brain and how do those where do the where do those ideas come from? So in one sense, there are different ways that we can think about this, but in one sense, uh, I think a very uh, defining moment is in the beginning of the 1900s when a series of neuroanatomists, Broadman being perhaps the best well-known representative, defined maps of the of the of the cortex of the human brain based on cytoarchitectonic differences, cell densities, cell type, 
sale arrangements and, and, and so forth, proposing on the order of around 50 units of, of anatomical areas that had, the idea was had some specific computational or functional or, or, or specific functions. A little bit later in the century, what we arrived at was the era of computers. So the combination of this, these early ideas of Broadman and many others, which were obviously not formulated in terms of computations, they were formulated in terms of having, like, as they used to call, independent organs of the mind. But when you put together the idea of computers, then we, we, we arrive at a something sort of like an inescapable way of thinking about the brain in terms of regions that compute well-defined functions. So there's a series of well-defined regions that, def that compute well-defined functions. And if we fast forward to today, the same ideas still really dominate our field. In fact, we have very sophisticated new parcellations that are trying to replace Broadman's parcellation, for instance, such as the one by Van Nissen, that suggests that the brain has around 360 regions, 100 in each hemisphere. So that by the brain here, I just mean cortex for now. And the computational metaphor, obviously, it's, it's present with us as, as, if, as, as closely in our lives, as close in our lives as one can imagine. We all carry these supercomputers in our pockets. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is, is why do we do this? Why, where does this idea come from? And this is obviously a very natural idea that comes very naturally to science for many reasons. And I've been trying to write a little bit about these ideas. But one of the one of the reasons is because we subscribe to a notion of atomism, in which the world is made up of substantial particles or things. There are these things that you can touch and you can cut away from other things, and they're individual components of particles or substances. That comes all the way from this this notion of atoms from the Democritus and and other thinkers in in, in Greece. And these ideas. Although many of these early ideas were completely discarded by modern giants of thinking, such as Boyle in, in chemistry and Newton in physics, the idea of atomism was, was maintained and, and kept at the center of, of this, this way of thinking, this Cartesian way of thinking. So the idea that we treat the brain in this way today is, is not surprising at all. In fact, it's so enshrined that you can think, what are even the alternatives? What can we even think of, conceive of? Are there any alternatives that we could reliably and, and justifiably move to? We can also go back to Greece, now this time with Heraclitus, to look at a different worldview, a world that is not made of things, but a world that is made of processes. Processes sort of like as enshrined in his everything, everything flows or banter ray dictum that no person ever steps in the same river twice. It's a view that is inherently dynamic and that is comprised of processes that are extended in time. So let me just very briefly give you an idea of what I have in mind here. In, in neuroscience, we might think in terms of a sort of Newtonian billiard ball causation model in which you might think of what happens to region B, region B based on the activation by some external stimulus to region A and connections between region A and B leading eventually to changes in region, region B. So it's sort of a billiard ball, very Newtonian way of thinking about things. So what are kind of, what are possible alternatives to this in terms of thinking in terms of that type of atomic interaction? We could think, for instance, in terms of these two brain regions, as they are perturbed by an external stimulus, that their coevolution, meaning the evolution of their signals, their activities, their spiking rate, their bold activity, their relation, the relationship between their activities as a function of time 
is something that now becomes the object of interest as opposed to that more of the previous picture that I painted. And of course, we have many particles in the brain, many regions in the brain. Perhaps we need to redefine them, but in any case, it, it makes sense to, to think about some units that are affected by, let's say, a, both a, uh, an external stimulus, but in the face of some ongoing internal activity, then reacts to this and, and changes in time. So with these very vague ideas that uh, describing the way I've been thinking lately, uh, I'm going to go back 10 years ago and, and, and discuss some of the first steps that we had into, into thinking about how we can actually put all these things together, put perception, cognition, emotion, motivation together in some somewhat like a very vague, but in some sense, way of organizing our thinking experimentally. How can we put all of these components together in a way that we can try to understand the both brain and behavior in terms of this overall framework? So in this framework, one of the ideas is that there are uh, shared processes between emotion and cognition. These are not separate entities, but they are deeply intertwined. I'm, I'm not going to have the time to, to elaborate here today, but Essentially, you can think of some key processes for, for cognition, such as inhibition, updating, shifting information in mind, and, and how threat is actually integrated here in a way that it affects it, but in a way that not only the communication is from threat to this part here, but the way processes that are shifted and information is updated or inhibited actually affect what is in influence, what is motivationally and effectively relevant. So it's a two-way street that we've been investigating in the past 10 or so years. And we've looked at many experiments of these interactions between emotion and cognition in the domains of working memory, attention, response inhibition, conflict processing, and so on and so forth. This is not what I'm going to be focusing on. Broad range of cognitive, motivational, and effective manipulations. What I want to do today is to describe briefly a few examples of these kinds of interactions and their implications for our understanding of large scale processing in the brain. So when we take this, this framework and we extend to not only emotion, but also include motivation, then the hypothesis is extended to suggest that emotion and motivation are deeply intertwined with cognition. So we have these so-called cognitive processes of executive control processes that are deeply in, in influence and influence as well, threat and reward. But this is an example here in a more specific experiment that we ran with Srikant, Srikant Padmala, who is, is, is now uh, back, uh, back in India and has his own faculty position. We studied a very simple Stroop-like task in which the task was to determine whether the, the picture the person was seeing was a building or a house. So a very simple uh, task, but that had either congruent or incongruent uh, um, words here uh, on, uh, so overlay on, on the, the stimuli, and the person had to indicate uh, the picture type without paying attention or or while ignoring, ignoring was, in, they were instructed to ignore the the, the words. So you could have, again, in the, you could have a congruent stimulus here with the house or an incongruent here, one, uh, an incongruent one here. And we also had a, a, a neutral condition so that we can look at both um, slowing down and facilitation, interference and facilitation in the context of stroop like tasks. So the task was very simple. There was a cue at first that indicated whether the person was either in the reward condition or the no reward condition. In the reward condition over a, a group of trials, not every trial they could earn $20, not that much, but over a set of trials they had the, 
the, the potential to earn if they were correct and fast enough to earn an extra $20 for the experimental session. So the trials themselves across the two trial types were identical. And essentially, there are a few parts here that have to do with fMRI scanning and separating task phases that we don't need to discuss now. But essentially, the person had a one second task period in which they had to indicate whether this was a house or a building. Obviously, here a building and an incongruent trial and a congruent trial. In terms of the behavior, very briefly, which is not what I'm going to be focusing too much on today, is the idea defined in here that we did find a reward by cognition interaction in that the effect of interference slowing down during an incongruent trial was redu reduced with reward. So what we found was that during the no reward condition, the incongruent trial as we had expected, leads to a slowing down of the responses, right? So this is the classical interference effect in an incongruent trial. What happens during a reward trial is that two things happen. One is that participants are overall faster and un as well as a specific component of reducing the interference. So the, the difference between these two times here, which was relatively large in this case, is smaller now in, in this present case. And we can do a lot of analysis to understand if this is sort of like a legitimate interaction. And, and, and But the bottom line here is, is, is that we believe it's an interaction because although there's a speeding up, it's not that the person is all of a sudden responding under 400 milliseconds or even under 500 milliseconds, sort of like leading to some kind of response compression or floor effect. A dynamic range of reaction times, so that doesn't compress the, the, the differences here and, and, and we, we get an interaction pattern for uninteresting reasons. But anyway, what I'm really interested in discussing with you today is giving examples of the brain. How does executive function interact with reward in this kind of experiment? So one of the things that we were interested in was understanding during the acute period, regions that were important for attention, such as front of front of eye field or regions in parietal, in regions in parietal cortex, such as the intraparietal sulcus, regions that which, which are historically well known to be important for attention in executive function, and at the same time, looking at regions that are important for reward processing, such as here, the nucleus accumbens in the ventral striatum. And so what we what we did was we looked at the fluctuations that responses in in these regions, both these of these regions on trial one, trial two, and so on and so forth. And what we did was to compute then the functional connectivity, the correlation of trial by trial responses in a, for pairs of regions, let's say the IPS and the accumbens and the FEF and the accumbens. So we, we have a measure of the functional connectivity between these regions that are important for attention and the regions that are important for reward. And again, very briefly here, I apologize for just, just not providing the in-depth details, but hopefully if you're interested, you can take a look at the papers. What we found is that in the presence of reward, this coupling here, this functional connectivity as we define, increased with reward. And this increase actually varied as a function of individual differences of reward sensitivity. An individual might be very prone to reward, very sensitive to reward and get very excited about reward. Others are less so, and those are evaluated by standard questionnaires. And what we found is that these differences actually were covariant as a function of individual differences. Even though this number here is relatively small, 54 for current standards, that suggests that for us to understand individual differences, we really need much larger samples. Uh, it it is, provides a little bit of an evidence and uh, um, sort of preliminary data suggesting that this, this, this effect of the, the enhancing of the coupling with reward is actually that 
covariates with individual differences. But one of the things that we've done for a long time, and many, many in the field have done for a long time, is look at interactions between pairs of regions, as I mentioned, between, let's say, something here in parietal cortex and something here in the striatum. In the last 10 years or so, maybe eight years or so, we've actually been focusing on a different way of looking at this, one that incorporates network analysis, one in which we use tools for graph, graph theory and network analysis to try to understand large scale of interactions that go beyond just pair, pairwise relationships. So in this case here, what we did was during the tap, during the, during the Q phase, we actually selected all the brain regions that were engaged during the Q phase, irrespective of what direction they were, if they were more for reward or more for, for, for the no reward condition, just having an effect of, of that point was at the criterion for us to select these regions as regions of interest. So these were the regions that we're interested in performing our network analysis. And they are the nodes in our graphs that are gonna become used in our graph analysis. And the connections between regions are the functional connectivity values. The, in other words, the trial by trial response correlation that we compute that I indicated before become the strength of the link between two regions. And just briefly here for network visualization, which I'm going to be using in a couple of places, you might have in some arbitrary graph here, a series of nodes. And in this force layout scheme, what we see is that different clusters of the set of nodes geometrically separate each other from each other, such that they are farther from the clusters that have different functional connectivity and close to the nodes that have most the most similar co functional connectivity. So in a social network, people, to, people that talk to each other are here and people who don't talk to these other people are in some other part of the space and they themselves talk to each other and form another cluster. When we perform uh, a community, a so-called community detection analysis, uh, a standard clustering procedure, we found two communities or clusters during the no reward condition. And again, these are the clusters that were observed during the, the, the period of the task when people were seeing these, these cues. So there's nothing in, inherently fundamental that it's the unique and only way to subdivide the brain, but it's one possible way that we can cluster all these regions. And interestingly, in the clustering algorithm, most of the regions that were important for more attention-related processing cluster together, and most of the perhaps reward-related regions also cluster together in a separate group of regions. So we find two clear cl cut clusters of, of, of regions that have a little bit of an interaction during the no reward condition, but they have much more functional connectivity between pairs of nodes within the region, within the clusters, than between the clusters. In fact, that's what defines the clusters. Our question was not exactly what's going on at any one given condition, but what happens with the manipulation to this what, what happens to this structure that we observe during reward, during the manipulation, when we introduce reward? So when we introduce reward to this exact same structure here, what happens? We maintain the cluster that's fixed. We didn't, make, we didn't perform another clustering analysis. What we were interested in understanding is how the interactions between nodes that are not from within the cluster, but are from between cluster, these are the ones that are in purple here that we had, how do they change? And what we found is that a near universal increase in the functional connectivity between the nodes from the cluster one to the cluster two, such that the modularity that was inherent in the segregation between these two clusters here, which was the criterion to define these two clusters, is largely decreased in the presence of reward. So in other words, what is happening is that not only from a standpoint of a pair of regions, 
are regions becoming more functionally coupled with reward, but in fact, there's a very large scale re reorganization of the community structure that is taking place to support this task during the queue, that the reward condition sort of reorganizes it so that they, instead of being two clusters that are fairly separate, they now are much more integrated. Okay, uh, should, should I stop for questions or should I just go to the end or continue going? What's the best way to do this? I think uh, you uh, continue with your presentation because at the end of the presentation, we'll take the Q&A and okay. people, people are typing in their question in the chat box. Okay, ah, so I think great. that's the best strategy because uh, you can do an interim summary of your work. Uh, but I think better that we take the Q&A at the end of your uh, talk. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So in, in, in this example here, we, we, I was calling these large-scale changes. In a sense, they are large-scale large scale changes because these involve regions that are quite disparate spatially in the brain. But there's another sense of large-scale, which is the large number of regions that might be involved. I think here was about... Uh, 15, 16 regions, if I remember correctly. And in another study, we tried to understand uh, a, a larger range of, of regions and how they would be interacting. So what we did here was a, a, a very simple experiment in which, in this case, we we're looking at negative, negative processing, emotional processing, during the, the possibility of a threat of shock. So in this study, the person was just, it's, it's a name that I gave that people in my lab didn't like very much. I think Shri didn't like very much either. I call it sort of like an anxious resting state because the person rests there for 60 seconds on average, each, each period varies from 42 to 77 seconds during either a threat condition, which, which they see a symbol that said they could receive from zero to four shocks during the during 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 the, the, the block or the, when they're doing a safe block during which they're not going to receive any 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 shock so you have sort of like a an anxious state here for 60 seconds and a more relaxed state here because we really don't violate this rule we never shock them and the analysis that i'm going to be presenting here the shock, the shock trials themselves are separated or 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 accounted for in ways that uh, allow us to focus on the anticipation just in this study. So we're thinking of looking in terms of large scale uh, networks. So what we did was we went to a Yale's general physiology classic paper in which he presents the seven networks, and we considered three of his networks, the three key of his net, three key networks of his scheme, which I'm going to show in a second. And what we performed was a network analysis called net information flow based analysis, in which we try to compute two measures. One is current flow efficiency, which essentially measures the strength of the connections between two nodes, which can be directly connected here via the most direct path between the nodes, but also between every other possible path that can connect the nodes. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a, an interesting framework that tries to generalize efficiency by acknowledging that information can influence a pair of nodes in perhaps in many different, by going via many different paths. So the strength of these connections are essentially what we had mentioned before, the functional connection, the fun functional connectivity strength, which is the time series correlation. There are other measures that I'm not going to be discussing today for the for brevity, but another one is current, current flow between us, which identifies nodes or hubs that have strong paths that pass through them, indicate that they can form import, important nodes, uh, in, in important hubs of information that flow through the network. 
provide a measure of what we call centrality. So what did we do? So we had a sustained period of, in this task, we had a sustained period after a brief transient of activity of entering in the state, entering into this block, which is you kind of all of a sudden figure out which of the two block trials you are in, and you figure out that you're either in the threat block, in the safe block, and then you have a sustained period after this transient into the block, a sustained period of uh, 30 or so seconds. What we did was to perform a network analysis. On, on this sustained period by looking at nodes from the salience executive task negative network, as well as regions that are important for effective processing and the, the threat of shock, including a region called the bed nucleus of the street terminalis and a, a region uh, and, and which most people don't know about and a region that everyone knows about the amygdala. And I'm not gonna be talking too much about these two regions, but we're gonna go back to another study that talks about them a little bit. And we can talk about that in the Q and A. So essentially what we were interested was what was the network organization during the safe period? So during the safe period, the salience, the nodes, the regions of the brain, a series of regions, there were a total of 51 regions spanning the salience executive task network and the, the other regions here. These regions, they had relatively high functional connectivity between themselves in, the, in the specific networks, such as for instance, the salience network and relatively less functional activity between these networks and some other network, for instance, for instance, the blue network here. But again, the important thing was not exactly this configuration, because I don't think that there's some inherent true state or, or configuration. There are many ways of characterizing these states. What we're interested in instead was how does it change from a period in which a person was experiencing safety to a period in which the person is experiencing threat. And what we see here is there's a, a large degree of reorganization that, in fact, what we find is that widespread changes in functional connectivity with decreased synchrony or functional connectivity within these specific networks that we observe. And we can actually quantify this very rigorous, rig rigorously in terms of specific measures of network organization, one of which is called efficiency, and perform statistical tests that actually confirm that there's this decreased efficiency, which was the index that I defined before. Uh, within, there's a decreased efficiency in the context of the salience, executive, and task negative networks. So they essentially became, they become with threat, they become less cohesive entities or networks during the threat state. <clears throat> okay, let me shift to another set. <clears throat> I mentioned in the very beginning of the, the talk that I'm really interested in dynamics, and this is a very snapshot type of dynamics, very impoverished type of dynamics, what happens from safe, from the safe period to the threat period. What we're really interested in is moving into something that is inherently dynamic. And this is the paradigm that I'm going to describe today, which is the moving circles paradigm. It's essentially, there are two circles moving on the screen. They meander on the screen with semi-randomness. Uh, uh, and <clears throat> as they get closer to each other, they become more uh, anxiety-provoking pr because if they touch at any point, you, you receive an aversive shock. So they, they can move around and they can go uh, close to each other and they can go back away from each other and so on. But the closer they are, it, it, the more anxiety producing they, they, they become given the possibility of shock. So we ran this in a kind of unusual way with no blocks or events, just simple like extended runs of trials. And what we're interested in doing is characterizing activation as a function of three parameters. Proximity, how close the circles are to each other, right? So they're very close to each other, the circles, or they are away from each other. The direction, whether you are at certain proximity, but you are approaching or retreating, right? 
Also, the speed varied a little bit. This didn't very, very strong, did not vary strongly across the experiment. We didn't design to, to, to have it very abrupt changes of speed go really slowly and then speed up. But there were a few changes in speed to increase unpredictability. So we included that as also one of the explanatory variables. And obviously, See, all these three factors interact with each other, right? There is the proximity versus direction. You can have you can have close proximity when you are approaching or close proximity when you're retreating. So that's an interaction between those two factors. So what we did was we performed a simple general linear model, a simple multiple regression analysis that simply used variables, the variables that I was discussing before, proximity, um, direction, speed. As, as explanatory variables, as well as their potential interactions to explain the activity that we're seeing during this meandering of the circles when the person is just observing this. So what we found, uh, again, just briefly a few of the findings, what we found was that just for instance, analyzing proximity in this dynamic, 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 dynamical paradigm was that when the circles were closer than farther, we found activity in a, in a set of regions related to uh, attentional processing, a person is, is paying more close attention to the stimuli, but to the stimuli, but also regions that are important for uh, salience and uh, the evaluation of effective significance, including the thalamus, including the anterior insula, and so on. And likewise, as the circles retreated from each other, then what we see is a very interesting pattern that person and goes into a more relaxed state that very much looks like a, a kind of resting state pattern. We also looked at interactions, the proximity by, by direction interaction, so that what we saw is that as the circles get closer and closer during the approach, then activity increases parametrically and, and then if the circles after being closer and cl being closer and closer, they now start going retreating from one another, the activity now decreases. So we have uh, an interaction in that the, the activity depending depends on the proximity, but as well as the direction of this of this uh, this this the situation that the circles are in, the configuration that the circles are in. And just to give you an example here a little bit more in terms of the actual responses and not just these parametric fits, uh, what we can show here is, is, is a situation where we had, we designed this task so that it would have what we call near misses. The, st the stimuli would be get, get really close and then go back. So what we found was that during a period of approach, there was an increase in activation. And during the period of retreat, then there was a decrease in activation. And this is the, the, the part that there's a turn that the circles come close together and the near miss that they turn. And given the lag in the hemodynamic response, we essentially, we can discuss this in the, in the QA period if you want, but essentially we, we, we need to consider a few more points here as part of the approach and wait a little bit because of the hemodynamic lag to take these points as more representative of the responses in this structure during the retreat period. So the approach and retreat. And we see other regions, including the one that I mentioned before, the bad nucleus of the sphere of terminalis, which is a, a structure that is in, in incredibly important during the processing of aversive, sustained, uh, temporally extended stimuli that have a clear evolution here of increasing their responses during the approach and then decreasing during the, during the retreat. Okay. So, so this, this last component here that I want to present, this last study here, is that this is all nice and good, but what I'm really interested in doing now is really trying to understand how we can represent dynamics in the brain, activity that fluctuates dynamically over larger, longer periods of time. So you might have a series of regions and a series of specific tasks that the person is doing, and they have this, this signals across these multiple regions. So how can we understand the structure of these 
temporal fluctuations across time. What we did in this study was a computational study from an engineering PhD was to study how we could use recurrent neural networks to capture this temporal evolution. So the scheme that we use is fairly simple. We had the regions of interest, a series of numbers of interest, a, a series of regions of interest, 360 of them. And the time series for each region is actually what comprises the input of the system. This input of the system is then provided to an intermediate layer of units, computational units, in the, what is called the reservoir, that actually are excited by the input and they persist in time. They have memory, but a decaying memory so that they forget the past with a certain decay rate. And they have recurrent interactions here so that, such that a given region can influence another region and be influenced by another one. So it has a complex structure here, which in fact, there are theorems that show that you can actually set this up in a random fashion. And I'm gonna explain a little bit why in a second. Because this reservoir is not learning any properties of the dynamics of these dynamics that we're trying to learn. What they do is actually create a high dimensional version of this lower dimensional representation here. This lower dimensional representation in this case had 360 dimensions, which was the input. And this high dimensional here can, for instance, be a factor of 10. So it can be a few thousands of thousands of units. And these units now are connected to a simple readout layer, a simple support vector machine classifier, or logistic regression classifier, it can be any classifier, but our goal here is based on the information that is received by this classifier, now try to label whether this input is from class A versus class B. Is this, uh, what kind of stimulus are we seeing here? So to test that, we use human connectome project data that has a class of stimuli that are more dynamic called social interactions. These social interactions are vignettes of approximately 20 seconds in which something that was initially designed in the 50s to convey abstract geometric objects, an idea of uh, social interaction. So it starts here with these triangles and a triangle and a circle being what seems to you after a little while being followed by this big mean person here so that they try to escape and at one point they figure out that this rectangle here is a little bit open and so they kind of together they hit this thing open here and they go they go and they kind of evade evade this big uh bad uh, triangle here that can't can't get to them and eventually gets distracted and they kind of hug here and huddle together, saying that they kind of believe that they uh, escaped uh, this 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 predator. So it's a series of things that convey some social. There's some kind of social. Them and then evolves in time across twenty seconds or so. And a control condition is one in which uses the same objects, but they just move randomly on the screen. They don't have any, um, they're just random motion. So what we did in, by using the machinery that I had defined before, and we can talk about it in the QA, how this works a little bit more, because I won't have time. It basically, what we find is that as the session, as the clip, which lasts 20 seconds, progresses in time, as this progresses in time, then we see that Classification accuracy, separating what is social versus random, actually increases in time, reaching eventually something like 90% or so, a few seconds into the block. It's interesting to compare that situation to the case in which there is no inherent dynamics, at least at the scale of fMRI studies, when we compare it to blocks of working memory, for instance, a two-back versus a zero-back condition, in which there isn't uh, much of a gain throughout the block as to what 
the classification correct correct classification is. So it kind of serves as a control. So in the last minute or so, what I want to do is to provide you with an idea of how to understand further the dynamics of these of these signals. So originally we had three three hundred and sixty RIs, but what we wanted to see is that could we actually summarize these results and capture signatures, core features of this these dynamics at, in a lower at a lower dimensionality. So we performed a very basic form of dimensionality in which we computed, we performed a principal components analysis, combined with selecting the dimensions, not based on the variance explained, but based on the, the, the dimensions that are most informative in terms of classification, whether you get this classification right or not. So that's what we did. And our goal is then in this reduced transformation, sorry, in this reduced dimensionality, represent our dynamics. How do we represent it? We represent it with a, a state space representation in which we take, let's say, three RYs here, and we use time only implicitly, implicitly, so that the activation at time one is the activation for in this three-dimensional space here, and for RYs one, two, and three at time one, at time two, at time three, and so on and so forth, by holding time implicitly in this time series, we can describe this trajectory in state space that summarizes what the activity across these three regions are for, for instance, task A, and do that the same thing for task B, for instance. So that's the logic of what we're interested in doing. The classification of the social versus random clips. And what we find is that the trajectories in both cases, they start very similar, times one, two, three, four, five, and six. Around time six or seven, they start diverging and they go to completely different parts of the state space, which is consistent with the fact that after a while, after this initial period, you actually get to a much better classification of whether a clip is social or random. And again, just as the form of control, if you look at the working memory case, they start already quite separate from each other and they evolve in parts of phase space, of state space that is disjoint from the other one, which again, consists with the fact that they have a, um, a relatively minor improvement in, in classification, but they stay constant roughly throughout. Okay, so just to wrap up in one or two minutes, um, I didn't have time to explore all of this so that it would lead to these conclusions, but broadening to the kind of research that I've been doing the last 20 so, or, or so years, I'd like to suggest that the brain basis of emotion and motivation really engages large-scale cortical subcortical networks, and that this, there's a high degree of signal distribution throughout the brain that provides the basis for a deep intermixing of information that is related to perception, cognition, emotion, motivation, and action. So these are not separate realms, they're intertwined. And one recent framework that I developed to try to explain that, if you're interested, is one that I, in which I describe these large-scale systems in, in terms of functionally integrated systems that is in a recent paper in TICS. So my suggestion is that, yes, we have uh, been dominated in neuroscience by this, these views that have to do with atomism, but I think that there's a lot that we can do in process philosophy and give, just move away from just thinking of the world as, make, as being made up of substances, but thinking of, uh, of, of it as inherently dynamic so that we actually start treating the brain in terms of these inherently dynamic multi-scale processes. So I just briefly gonna thank um, the, lab members that did all of this work. Currently, Chiragin Bacha is, is doing a lot of the work uh, in, in the studies that we're doing, uh, extending these dynamic studies. Uh, Trikant was in my lab for, for, for 20 years or so, for, well, not quite 20 years, for a long time, for many years. 
and was integral in developing many of these paradigms and the analyses, as, as well as other people in the lab. And I'm very fortunate, and I just don't say this as a formality because it, it really is something that I feel extremely fortunate, fortunate to, to, to have um, sustained funding from the National Institute of Mental Health that allows us to, to perform this, this kind of exciting research. And if you're interested in some of these, in some of these ideas, just some of the papers, uh, you, can, you can take a look at our website. Uh, and now I'm also becoming uh, more involved in, in Twitter and the, the scientific part of Twitter. So if you want to uh, follow, follow me and, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop here and, and, and take, take, uh, take questions. Thank you very much.